I mentioned a little while ago that uh, thumper and the uh, mortar experiment require a range that has to be very carefully uh, measured. They've got a long uh, cord to measure that off with. Uh, for the thumper experiment, uh, they move out, uh, I think it's 150 feet, isn't it, uh, for the thumper? Ten feet, I guess it is. Uh, yeah, it's just three. Three of them, I think. Yeah, it's the three geophones. Uh, geophones. These are the devices that listen to the movements in the uh, lunar surface. And uh, one is placed ten feet out, another 160 feet out, another 310 feet out from the Alsup Central Station. And then uh, uh, after they've placed the furthest one out at 310 feet. Uh, they come back along the line and fire these 21 thumper charges, these little 22 caliber, or equivalent of 22 caliber explosives, uh, and uh, the geophones automatically measure the, uh, the reaction in the lunar surface. That same, I just think of the same uh, pattern, of course, is uh, where they have the mortar set up, which is another part of that same package that will be uh, activated after they leave. Right, that's a little more powerful explosive, and those, uh, the mortar carries, uh, which is aimed out uh, in the same direction, same area, uh, carries uh, four fiberglass rockets uh, that they, uh, uh, that are so uh, powered that they will go out four different distances as far as I think 5,000 feet out, isn't it something like That's that? That's right. And uh, they fire out uh, all the way out there and uh, after they've left when it's perfectly safe, in fact the last thing they do before they get aboard uh, uh, to come home is to arm this mortar uh, so that uh, it's not going to go off while they're there and walking around in front of it. <laughs> than he expected. Mark, hammer's running six frames per second. Roger. Shepard has just turned on the 16 millimeter camera. One of the documentation film cameras. And uh, for reference, Alan Ed, you're about uh, two nine minutes behind the timeline at this point, over. slop in a hurry. Yeah, they've got about an extra half hour, uh, they, they believe, in there. Okay, Ed is working on a central station and um, going over for the sub-pallet. Houston, the uh, RTG cable temperature is 175 degrees. And their uh, portable life support system, they're about an extra half hour beyond the four hours of the program, but they've just eaten that up. Now, if they just finish their program, get back on schedule, uh, from here on out, stay with the schedule, yes. they've already eaten up that half hour. And uh, Ed Mitchell, of course, or Al both were saying that they seem to feel it's going to take much longer than they anticipated. And, uh, this is typical when you have a lot of experiments. You, you try to do all you can and you pick out the best ones and go on and plot away doing them in order. I think that, uh, that big dish like fucking thing we see there is the super thermal ion detector, isn't it? Uh, you know? Uh, that's a. Uh, the one that also uh, catches charges of, uh, of the ions as they pass through the uh, lunar atmosphere, such as it is. Well, oddly enough, uh, it is not a zero atmosphere. There are uh, particles and there's some outgassing oh, apparently that uh, can be detected with super sensitive equipment, and that's what they're deploying now. It'll take a long time to get the data correlated. We'll deploy the uh, experiments before powering up the uh, central station. It's hard to achieve a perfect vacuum. Yes. This is why we come out of Earth orbit eventually. Uh, almost everything we've had up there uh, eventually. Pounds
runs against one or two molecules a day and eventually slows down and has to come back in again. subject of considerable controversy. Uh, years ago, um, Kordoluski, a Soviet block scientist, uh, reported clouds of debris in this area, or in these areas, and uh, the so-called Kordoluski clouds were searched for by many other astronomers, and uh, they could not find them, uh, except for a few. And they, they came and went, a bit like, uh, I guess it was a bit like looking for, for elves. Uh, and uh, there's been a c continuing controversy. Those that see them believe them, and those that don't, don't. It's sort of the uh, <coughs> Sargasso Sea of Space, I guess, isn't it? Where all the uh, yes. debris would catch up and uh, park there for a while. Uh, uh, I guess the big question is, will it park there long enough yes. to, to make for a concentration that you could detect? There certainly should be some concentration, but it may not be detectable. And with each flight, we're learning a little bit more about uh, space and what's out there and the effect on man, particularly on this flight where there was a very detailed experiment to see if they could uh, pin down the cause of little light flashes that were being seen by the astronauts, uh, particularly in the darkness uh, uh, on out there in space on the uh, translunar uh, flights. And uh, indeed, uh, with some uh, detailed experimentation in advance as to the to uh, 
identification of shapes and uh, that intensity of light, uh, all three of the astronauts uh, in the Apollo 14 on the way out were able to identify these cosmic flashes as they close their eyes in the dark are cosmic. They don't know that. These flashes that they think may be uh, cosmic light. And if indeed uh, this is happening, while they say that it's, uh, they don't believe it could be serious in uh, flight of the duration of uh, these moon missions, they're going to have to consider it uh, very carefully for longer flights in space. We're talking about those grenades, and we have our color picture back, as you note. Uh, the grenades that they're going to be firing up there from the mortar box uh, in these seismic uh, tests. Mm -hmm. Well, after Antares leaves the moon, it sets off the grenades. Uh, they will be read by the seismometer that the astronauts are leaving on the surface and are, in fact, deploying right at this very moment. Nelson Benton has a demonstration of uh, that experiment out at Grumman Aerospace. And Nelson? Parks that take place on the lunar surface, the Apollo 14 crew has provided for some planned impacts, among which is the plan to crash the ascent stage of the lunar module into the lunar surface after Shepard and Mitchell have left it for the homeward bound command ship. And among the scientific station that is left upon the moon's surface to measure, among other things, moonquakes, is being left behind a set of high-priced fireworks in what is called the mortar box assembly. Long after Apollo 14's departure, the mortar box antenna will pick up the command from the ground to fire one, a $20,000 grenade that will travel 5,000 feet and create its own disturbance on the surface. Later, another grenade will be fired 3,000 feet this time. At another interval, one will be fired 1,000 feet and still another grenade will be fired a distance of 500 feet. Their seismic effect will be measured by the moonquake equipment left at the scientific station and that data sent back to Earth from the transmitting unit of the array of experiments left on the lunar surface. The firing of these rocket-propelled grenades is designed as yet another means for scientists on Earth to study the moon's structure. And the grenades may be fired at an interval of one hour, less or longer, depending on when the scientists want them triggered. All of this may not take place until perhaps one year after Apollo 14 has come home. Walter? That, uh, that station uh, will be reporting back for a long time the uh, thermal uh, the nuclear uh, energy uh, package that uh, will power the station uh, uh, will last a lot longer, actually, than uh, some of the other instruments there on the moon. The plutonium-238 that, uh, that is in that uh, nuclear energy generator uh, has a half-life of 90 years, uh, which is a very, very long time, which is one reason it was chosen, that and the fact that it's a, a, a fairly inert form of radioactivity, you can't do a lot of harm, uh, but does create uh, enough heat so that uh, just, just by its own decay processes uh, to power this uh, electric station. You know, I'm somewhat intrigued, Walter. Uh, Al uh, Shepard's quite a golfer. I think he might be tempted to put out a mortar shot himself up here. I'd be very anxious to see if he does with a, a simulated golf ball. <laughs> see uh, what the... Uh, uh, astronauts, there they are. I can't see it any longer. Uh, let's do this. Hold it. Perfectly level. Oh, good. I don't want to just get the sun shadow in there. And you had it for a minute. Now. They're working hard. Uh, as I said, they're finding this more difficult than they thought. And uh, the heart rates uh, read out just a short while ago. So Shepard at 90 to 100, Mitchell at 100 to 120. And uh, that is a reflection of the, of the workload that they're carrying. When you think of uh, Al's original heart rate at 80, that's a good 20% increase in that yeah. sense. And uh, could very well indicate that he's really putting out. Incredibly, uh, during the landing this morning, which must have been yeah, exciting, Al Shepard so said had a heart rate of 80 at that time. Uh, was that normal? Off the, uh, he went up to 115 or so for the liftoff. I feel the exact figure was, but it was high. It would be parked for this activity. Apparently having a little difficulty.
testing one of the experiments from the package. I say it's that suprathermal ion detector experiment. I thought that was the one they already had up there. But uh, it's not the information I get here now.